when to look at formulations, how are you going to get various medicines in? But when infliximab came out in around about 19... I was having to go back and check, but it was 1999 it came out. And once infliximab came, we still had Crohn's patients on the ward, but the dramatic loss of bowel. And so it was different types of patients who came in who had lost a large sections of their bowel and needed to be on long-term home TPN, but it was infliximabs and the biologics that made such a difference to Crohn's and ulcerative colitis and actually really improved the quality of life of those patients. So that's why I chose infliximab. That's the one that comes from me. Brilliant. Absolutely. Monoclonal antibodies, they were one of the first really, weren't they? This is really geeky, but Jamie's dad, when we were students, he used to talk to us about monoclonal antibodies, didn't he, Jamie? He did. When was that? Yeah, 1991 that was. He was telling us about that. It was 1990. 1990. He's a microbiologist. And they have revolutionised patients care so absolutely good choice i was gonna say they're one of the few you know lots of drugs come out but there's not many drugs come out that are true game changers yeah and, that, and that, that's one of them isn't it yeah great choice and the quality of life of those people who got the infliximab and to not have to have so much surgery made a huge difference and also it helped with those people who got fistula but in some ways i will pick you up on one of the things you said in the first episode oh please do hopefully it's hopefully it's steve yeah it's steve sorry and because you were saying about how you thought the difference between hospital and community was that in hospital pharmacy it's more transactional you see a patient and then you never see them again well i think you just chose a bad specialty in hospital is what i'd say (laughs) that's fair comment yes i was talking about medical admission so you're dead right yeah so if you chose somewhere like intestinal failure so I worked on that ward for about 18 years so I was with some of these patients for 18 years when they got married had children divorced whatever so in some ways it's more than a transactional I accept that entirely but it goes back to this you even if you're working as a specialist Mm. though you need to keep generous skills which is one of the other episodes that we've discussed so and and I think a new feature should be where the guest um picks Steve up on something that he said (laughs) in a previous episode seconded (laughs) thirded because as I said you know we all need to learn to compromise that's fine I agree so what about a career anthem then come on lay it on us so um the only slight issue is you did steal my song because Deacon Blue and Dignity was probably one of my songs of university so I was at Strathclyde and it they played at my freshers ball which sounds glamorous but it wasn't it was just <laughs> it was Strathclyde yeah it was loads of people in a dark room with beer so I can't say that was so the one that I'm going to choose is I'm going to choose the Proclaimers I'm on my way so I choose the Proclaimers because they're sort of unashamedly Scottish and and um, the Proclaimers were the first band I ever saw. And it was 1983 in um, the ice rink in Inverness. It too was not glamorous. Um, <laughs> you know how to live, don't you? <laughs> I know. Oh, I've, I've had an exciting life. And so from then, the Proclaimers have sort of always been with me, really. And so I chose I'm on my way because that's quite a good way to describe your career. And also I like the fact is that Whenever they're singing, you can tell that they're Scottish. So whenever they're on, I will always sing them. And it's a good chance for me to sing in my Scottish accent badly. Excellent. And what an album. What an album. I know it's a good album, isn't it? Is it a really good album, isn't it? And it's a shame because normally this time of year, the pubs in Cardiff are full of rugby fans. And I know that England, Scotland in the, in a pub in Cardiff, the Proclaimers come on and the whole yeah. the whole place just goes goes bonkers we're very happy to take the proclaimers i'm on my way into the oral apothecary spotify playlist thank you very much and lastly but not leastly would you like to think about a book that you would like to offer into the oral apothecary library perhaps for listeners who are maybe starting out in their career that's changed your thinking i think my book has changed over the last few months and so originally i might have said a book that was all about imposter syndrome but we won't go there that's another episode for you to have on imposter syndrome but the book i was going to choose is personal resilience for healthcare staff when the going gets tough and it's by john edelston from 2013 and basically this book is about uh, how in healthcare in terms of all the different environments is one of the toughest places to work in terms of resilience in the fact is that there's so within healthcare itself it's a high pressure environment but also the number of changes you have in healthcare so as staff you're almost going through transformation of changes all the time which is further challenges for you to have to work through all this time and obviously everything 
everything that we've gone through with the pandemic, it's been such a challenge and the resilience of the staff, and we've talked about how tired people are, but it means being able to bounce back and do things like recovery is really difficult. So in the book, it starts off the first section, which is all about um, why healthcare is such a difficult place to work and the challenges you've got. The second section is some resources to actually improve your own personal resilience. And the final section is all some resources that you can use. And so one of the resources they talk about is something that we've been doing, which is called Appreciative Inquiry which I don't know if you've heard of that. Jamie will have. Yeah, through the coaching, it comes up. And so with the quality improvement team in our hospital, decided that during the COVID pandemic, appreciative inquiry would be a good way to actually talk to staff to find out what's gone well during the pandemic. And so with appreciative inquiry, rather than focusing on negatives and you're thinking about what's gone wrong, how can you improve things, you actually think about what's going well and how can you... I know that as safety too, yeah? yeah? So it's the safety yeah. too model, yeah. Well, I think, I think the thing about appreciative inquiry, isn't it, is that if you change the energy by asking a question about the positive as opposed to asking people yeah. about what went wrong, you instantly put someone in a different frame of mind and so yeah. you get more creative answers. That sounds like a great book. That's on my list to read. Well, it had a very long title, so I can't say, but we will definitely put it in the Oral Apothecary Library. But it's it's interesting what you said about an appreciation in the book that healthcare is different, because I never forget talking to someone who was who was worked in A&E, but also had worked in the army in some very difficult, I don't know what you call it, combat situations and in and the medical side of things. And, and they found the NHS harder. Um, and I think it was it was about the constancy of it and that sort of fluctuating change that you talked about. I've heard that said by people who've worked in different sectors. They say the NHS is just, is hard. I'm not saying it's harder than the army. I don't know, but this is what someone told me. Yeah, and one other thing is just, because you were talking about how recovery, that we need a rest before that. I don't think we're going to have that luxury i think we're going to have to go straight in because there's so many people need treatment and already we've hardly finished the third surge and we've got to have our recovery plans ready so we've got i don't think we have a choice sadly yeah okay great well all great choices thank you very very much Lindsay. okay thanks Lindsay. let's move on to our micro discussion next so recently published in the new england journal of medicine and receiving a fair bit of attention in the press once weekly semaglutide in adults with overweight or obesity who would like to start us off yeah i will if that's okay because i've changed my mind on this so a long time ago when i was working in the first started working in the diabetic clinic when i worked up north i started out thinking this idea well you know if you're overweight or obese you've got to do something for yourself you know you can't just have a pill for every ill and so if you like i was that in that camp to begin with and i then found that actually obesity as such is it's a unifying diagnosis is the way we always used to talk about it in hospitals you could have all these other conditions but the honest truth was it was the obesity that was tying that all together whether it be osteoarthritis in your hips and your high blood pressure in your heart attack etc etc and so the more I've worked with patients who have got diabetes and are overweight and obese I actually came to realize particularly when I was working in Manchester that drugs to help people to lose weight if it maintained can make a massive difference to that person's health but not only that but it will probably cause less issues for the NHS as a whole somewhere down the line so I've come full circle and in fact even in Manchester we used to do a lot they used to do a lot of bariatric surgery I think they actually did it at Salford didn't they Lindsay Mm -hmm. yeah And, and you have fantastic results with bariatric surgery so I'm actually all for it as long as people meet the criteria, which is, yes, you've got to have a very high BMI. You've still got to make an effort to change your calorie diet and do some exercise, which is what the NICE guidance says for liraglutide. But if you've done all of those things, then I'm all for it. Kimo, anything to add or Lindsay? I think I, I probably similar similar to Stephen in that, that, that you look at this one, but those two sides of the angle in this is the argument that it's down to lifestyle and, and, and that's what you need to address first. I'm not necessarily in that camp but I think there's some points there. And what worries me about this is it feels like we've been here before. Um, You know, I've seen headlines like this before about a drug that has an effect on obesity. And and obviously these stories gather a lot of interest. And so we end up talking about them. But there's a line, I've got got the BBC webpage up here and it it says, however, now Jan has come off the trial here, her appetite has returned and she's putting weight back on. Mm. And that's what we always see, isn't it? And and so I've got a feeling that I I hope it's a breakthrough. Um, I'm not an expert, 
Um, but I've got a feeling of deja vu on this one. Thank you. Lindsay? I think taking, if this drug works, I think it's better than bariatric surgery, mainly because I've seen the disasters from bariatric surgery. So some of the intestinal failure patients we had was when it went wrong. And I remember when we first started doing bariatric surgery and it was in the hospital at Salford, we talked about, well, how were the patients going to have all their medicines? And they said, oh, well, they're never really on very much. And then the first patient came in and they were on about 12 medicines. And you thought, how on earth are we going to get this these medicines into these patients so i think this injection and t- using this would be better than having bariatric surgery if it works but i did agree that when you saw that the weight's going back on afterwards so are these people going to have to stay on this for life and what would be the risks of that i can see that i think this would be better than surgery and certainly for the patient if it works so i've seen this in action so we've been using it in diabetic obese patients for a long while and I've had some fantastic results on it you do still have to do the rest of it. it it's a kickstart i used to call it a chemical ki- kickstart i can prescribe you a chemical kickstart but you're still going to have to do the rest of it yourself and so yeah we've had some fantastic results on it even at lower doses this is a higher dose remember and for some people they can't tolerate it so of course surgery is at the end but i'm just saying that putting your efforts into something so that the drain if you like on the nhs resources as well as for the the pain and all the quality of life issues that go for the patient i think that's money well invested if we can do the appropriate economic analysis on that yeah, well, so chemical kickstart, you need to start writing these things down, don't you? So that, uh, you know, you can share them with the uh, the greater good out there. Uh, the two bits I would like to bring people's attention to, if they're interested in reading further, one is Matthew Said's uh, editorial in The Times. Um, the obesity drug is a miracle, but the side effects are hard to swallow. And he's not describing the side effects, obviously the gastro effects that we all know about. He's taking that bigger view. And I've just circled a few quotes here. Um, and isn't it the collapse in individual responsibility one reason health spending is out of control? So, he, And he does write a very balanced piece in, in The Times, to be fair to him, saying, you know, where Steve was a few years ago. So, yeah, really interesting piece from Matthew Said. And then the Millbank Quarterly has just published a review on uh, obesity strategies in England, 1992 to 2020. There's been 14 strategies during that time. So there's the deja vu for you, <laughs> Gimmo. And, you know, are they fit for purpose? They tend to come down on the side that actually they're not taking implementation nearly as much as they as they should. So that's my addition to that debate. Well, I'm going to quite simply say to end, it's quite simply the elephant in the room. No. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you very much for that micro discussion. Little gems and chemical kickstarts. I love it. I hope you can join us next time when our special guest will be Professor Mark Torbert. Mark is an NHS palliative care consultant, an honorary professor at Cardiff University School of Medicine. He founded TalkCPR.com and has a national lead role in improving public understanding of topics relevant to care in the last years of life. He's given TED Talks, written for international newspapers, and has talked about medical topics at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, at Hay Literary Festival, and the Science Museum in London. So we look forward to welcoming Mark to the Oral Apothecary for our next episode. I'm going to tune in for that one. Thank you. Once again, thank you very much, Lindsay, for joining us, and to our audience for downloading and listening. Over to Gimmo for the final ingredient. Okay, so thanks, Lindsay. That was that was fantastic. And, and if, if anyone does want to get in touch with us, they can email us at oralapothecarypod at gmail.com or at twitter is at oral apothecary um, and talking about social media so we're on episode five now i think you've only listened to episodes one and two we've got over 300 followers on twitter and we've had over 600 downloads so big thank you to everyone who's listened and engaged we've had some really nice feedback as jamie said this is a labor of love for us but it's fantastic that people are enjoying it so thank you very much um, thanks to Rob Davis from Wrexham, who took the time to email us. Apparently, I once called him the oldest prescribed advisor in town. Um, so sorry about that, Rob. I don't remember saying it, but it, it does sound like something that I would say. Rob went to, on to mention about the setup they've got in North Wales, following on from the conversation with Claire Howard. They've got, they call it healthy prostatin, and they've got true multidisciplinary working up there, pharmacists, technicians, advanced nurse practitioners, nurses, physios, GPs, OTs, etc., all working together. I think actually, Jamie, and that's that's modelled on the Nuka model from Alaska. But they are doing social prescribing. Was what you wanted to tell me up there, which is which is what Claire was talking about. So that's I think that's one possibly for us to discuss in the future. He would also like to do a feature where we track our fitness um, based on the conversations we had about Zwift and boot camps. 
So that one's going in the bin, I think. Sorry about that, Rob. Agree. Yeah, in the bin. <laughs> yeah, the engagement on Twitter has been great. So thank you, everyone, who's talked to us. Um, there was a lot of love for Claire's book, Invisible Women. Liz Corterville um, has suggested antimicrobial stewardship, cardiovascular disease, and reducing inequalities as future topics. So you'd be glad to know, Liz, that these are on our list. But I wanted to finish with the final ingredient. So this one comes from one of our Twitter followers, um, Sue Goodfellow. So Sue, like me, is an improvement advisor, but is also a GP 